Biden, corn, and China. Three words that you probably never ever thought would ever be in the same sentence together. Maybe two of those words, hmm? But not all three. Today I'm gonna link Biden, China, and corn. And I might be laughing right now, but it's because it's so endlessly fucked up. This is so fucked up. That I had to do a podcast on it. I had to dedicate an episode. I was trying to get away from these like debunking sort of videos, but uh, one, I thoroughly enjoy them. And two, whenever I find something out that just blows my mind, I feel that it is my responsibility to share it with the like three people that watch these and listen to these podcast episodes, but at least it exists somewhere on the internet in hopes that one day, if someone is ever looking this up, they can they can find these podcast episodes. So let's get into it. I will apologize in advance. My allergies are absolutely horrible and I can never breathe this time of year. So if I sound nasally, <laughs> you're welcome. So first I want to get into some definitions. There's only a few, but the reason why I wanted to talk about these things is because they're going to lay the groundwork. So when I say things like GMO or organic, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're on the same page when it comes to what I mean when I say those things. Okay, so the first definition I wanna get into is GMO. So that's Golf Mike Oscar, if we wanna phonetically spell it out. And GMO stands for Genetically Modified Organism. And I'm going to read this definition straight from the, this is the government's definition of a GMO. So a GMO is a plant, animal, or microorganism that has had its genetic material, DNA, changed using technology that generally involves the specific modification of DNA, including the transfer of specific DNA from one organism to another. Scientists often refer to this process as genetic engineering. So when I, today, when I say GMO, I am specifically referring to organisms that have been genetically engineered. And later on in this episode, I'm gonna talk about an immunologist, a PhD who I once respected, who compared the average poodle, that's right, the dog, a poodle, to corn, to genetically modified corn. And uh, she has since updated her post to remove that comparison because it is wildly inaccurate there's when you think gmo you think scientist in a lab coat in a you know laboratory slicing and dicing dna we did not do that to get to a poodle right that's called selective breeding that is entirely different than gmos gmos are genetically modified they take the good stuff from this plant and the good stuff from that plant and they put it into this plant and they get a cool gmo plant um, I'm honestly not really skeptical of GMOs. I think that they've done a lot of, a lot of good. There's been no real evidence that they're not, you know, that they're bad, but again, we'll get to that. So when we talk about GMOs, mind you, right, my, my background is security is in investigations and is in business, primarily in those, those categories, right? I have an extensive background in science as it relates to health and fitness, but nothing this deep, right? So I'm gonna stick to my swim lane when I talk about these things. So if you're a genetic engineer or a bioengineer of some sort, and you want to share your feedback in the comments because there just so happens to be a bioengineer watching this episode, like feel free. But I'm gonna stick to what I know because I'm gonna stick, I'm gonna stay in my swim lane. My expertise is gonna come in handy. GMO soybeans, for example, they make up 94% of all soybean plants in the United States. So all the soybean that's planted, 94% of it is genetically modified. Then there's GMO cotton. 96% of all cotton planted is genetically modified. And then the key, the most important one, here's the first word that I talked about earlier, right? Genetically modified corn makes up 92% of all corn planted in the United States. And if you're like, why is this bitch naming off random ass plants? Well, they're not random, and I'm gonna tell you why. Here's the, here's the info. 
Here's the, the lay of the land, if you will. So those are big numbers, right? We're talking 90 plus percent of some of our largest crops are all genetically modified. Take that take that little fact, you know, fold it up and put that shit in your pocket because we're going we're gonna to pull it out in a second. But for now, keep it in your pocket. The next definition, right, because I said there was going to be a few, the next definition I want to talk about is organic. Now, when I say organic, I'm referring to organically grown and organic agriculture. Organically grown, right, so organically grown food is food grown and processed using no no zero synthetic fertilizers or pesticides pesticides derived from natural sources such as biological pesticides may be used in producing organically grown food that means that instead of dumping a bunch of glyphosate on our fields and if you don't know what I'm when I what I mean when I say glyphosate you can watch that episode I'll leave a link for it in the description but They're not dumping a bunch of glyphosate, right? They're dumping natural stuff. We're talking vinegar, lemon zest, right? That's that's what they're using to combat any sort of pests, whether it's being used as an insecticide, which is used to kill insects, or a fungicide, which is used to kill fungus. Those those things is, is kind of what we're talking about when we say pests. Pesticide is the next definition, and It seems to be just like a blanket term, right? Anything that's a pest, that can be mice, that can be powdery mildew, right? That can be some sort of fungus, or that can be like a hornworm, like an insecticide. The term pesticide in the literature is kind of this like blanket term that they give to all of these different sorts of asides, if you will. And the very last definition that I wanted to make sure we all understand perfectly well is patents and i'm enunciating that on purpose because i always say patents and you know it's patents if you will there's two t's and a patent is a legal right that gives an inventor exclusive rights to their inventions such as a device process or substance and i'm not a lawyer which i say over and over again but there there is a lot of legality that goes into this and for patents there are utility patents there's plant patents there's a lot of different types of patents but when i man i'm saying patents a lot <laughs> but when i talk about it today i'm specifically going to be talking about patents as they relate to genetically modified organisms right the intellectual property of some big businesses that we're going to get into and as you can imagine Patents are managed by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Ooh, yes, the McGun. Now, when we talk about intellectual property, there's patents, there's trademarks, there's copyrights, and I'm sure there's more, again, not a lawyer, but those are the big three that I know as a business owner and as somebody who has patents under my name. I have trademarks and trade secrets. So I'm somewhat familiar with that as it relates to me and what I've done, but it's just a general term that I wanted to make sure we go over. So moving right along, Now that we have the definitions out of the way, I'm going to get into the meat and potatoes of this, right? Ah, for the meat and potatoes. The first thing I want to talk about is corn, (laughs) okay? The United States is the largest producer of corn in the world. That's a lot of motherfucking corn. 90 million acres of it, to be specific. We have 90 million acres of just corn. Now, after corn, there's sorghum which i'm probably saying wrong which is a cereal crop side note if you ever purchase bird food right like the bird seeds to put in your bird feeder like i have um, i made the mistake of letting some of that bird seed kind of hit my very nutrient-rich soil because i have a garden in my backyard and it started growing these this random shit this like random stalks of grain i had no idea what it was but i left it right because it's kind of in an area that um, I don't really have anything planted. I have some rose bushes back there and a rose arch and my bird feeder. So I let this shit grow. I ended up using Google image search and it was sorghum. So just know that the bird seeds that you are feeding your birds or putting in your bird feeder are potential. They're, they're actual seeds. They could potentially grow into things like sorghum, which is a cereal crop. So just so you're aware. So we have 90 million acres of corn. Now, we don't keep all of the corn that we grow, right? We obviously trade it. We trade it to other countries. 45% of all of the corn that we grow is used for ethanol. It's not used to be the ear of corn that you buy in the produce section. 
right? 45% of the corn that we grow is, you know, turned into ethanol, which I'm going to talk about how that happens in a second. So that's 45% of all of the corn. Now, what about the corn that we keep? What about the corn that we don't trade? Well, 40% of domestic corn use is for livestock feed. So that's the shit that's feeding our like cows and pigs and chickens and shit like that. There's also a term called FSI, which is food, seed, and industrial. Some of the images that I'm going to be sharing and some of the and some of the things that I'm going to be talking about if you are reading the blog post later or if you're reading the reference list later is going to mention FSI, which is kind of how the USDA kind of lumps everything together in terms of where our corn is going. 60% of domestic corn is used for FSI. So 40% is going to livestock feed. The other 60% is going to food, seed, and industrial. I'm going to assume that when they say industrial, they mean ethanol, because based on everything that I read, that's kind of what it points to. So corn, how do we get ethanol? How do we get ethanol from corn? And the process is probably exactly as you think it is, but there are two different types of millers, right? These are going to be the factories that you see next to like cornfields. And if you've ever, now I was stationed in uh, good old Great Lakes when I was in the Navy and I had taken a road trip at one point to drive back to New York, which is where I'm from. And I passed a lot of cornfields if you're from Illinois, Indiana or anywhere over there. Uh, and it is this god awful smell that you get from cornfields, from corn, from the from the cornfields themselves, but from the factories next to cornfields. And it's because those factories are doing one of two things: they're either dry milling or they're wet milling. So a wet milled product from corn becomes things like high fructose corn syrup, and glucose, and dextrose, and starch, and corn oils, and beverage alcohol and industrial alcohol, and sometimes fuel for ethanol. So wet milled literally means they're making wet products. So think of like, for me, in my mind, I think of like syrup, right? High fructose corn syrup. I just think of like a liquid. Dry milled, however, takes that corn and turns it into flakes for cereal, corn flour, corn crits, which I don't even know what the fuck that is, corn meal, and brewer's grit for beer production. So wet milled makes wet stuff, dry milled makes dry stuff. So 94% of our ethanol in the United States is produced from corn. We don't, I don't even know where, the, the other 6% comes from who f***ing knows. But so 94% of ethanol in the United States is produced from corn. That's a lot of it, right? That's 90, 94%. 90% of the ethanol that we make, so 90% of the 94%, comes from dry milled. Right, so dry milling is our primary process for making ethanol. So what happens is the dry millers grind the corn into flour, then they ferment that flour and it becomes ethanol. The byproducts are distiller's grain and carbon dioxide. So in my opinion, I'm pretty sure when that carbon dioxide is released, that's that, probably that awful smell that we're smelling. I could be wrong. Wet millers, on the other hand, what they do is they separate the starch, the protein, and the fiber in the corn prior to processing any components into products such as ethanol. So they're going to take the shit that they need and whatever's left over, which in my mind I pictured like like a mush, like whatever's left, they'll ferment. But it's nowhere near as much as what's produced for dry mills. So just know that 94% is going to come from dry mills and that like last 6% is going to come from the the wet mills, or I'm sorry, the last 10% is going to come from the wet mills. And now if you're like, why the f*** are we using, why the f*** are we using so much corn for ethanol? Why is everybody, why is 45% of the corn that we're producing being used for ethanol? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to take this time to explain my evil plan. Because the ethanol is used in blends with gasoline to create mixtures such as E10, E15, and E85. So E10 is like 87 octane, 80, uh, E15 is like 88 octane, and E85 is probably the one that we're most familiar with because that's called flex fuel. And if you're like, okay, I hope you're catching what I'm about to throw at you. And then we look at the fact that corn is 80% of the grain market for global trade, right? Largest markets are Mexico, 
China, although that is the second key word, this is not the main point of why I want to talk about China, Japan and Colombia. So corn is extremely important and it's mostly because of the, these gasoline mixtures. As we're trying to go to quote unquote biofuels, you know, we're producing more corn. As a matter of fact, it's been exponential with the amount of corn that we've been producing, the amount of corn that's being, you know, asked of us and that's being traded. And a lot of that is going towards cleaner fuels, right? We're trying to get away from using, you know, from, from drilling for oil and we're trying to get away from, you know, other processes. Now, yes, there is electric vehicles and that whole lithium scandal. If people knew, maybe I'll do an episode on that too. But if people did just a little bit of research on how we obtain the lithium to make the batteries to then put in these electric cars, you would be out there driving a big old diesel truck. All right, let's talk money now because that is probably what most of you guys are here for because that is what I end all of my episodes in, right? The world can be entirely f***ed and I will still tell you how it's f***ed from the money perspective, right? Unless I can give it to you from like a security perspective, but let's talk about that. So I'm going to bring it full circle now. The very first definition that I gave in this episode was GMO. GMO, genetically modified, right? Somebody is slicing and dicing DNA. Well, it cost roughly $136 million to develop a GMO plant. Development of more resilient, high yield, genetically modified crops is being fast tracked around the globe. So the genetically modified corn and soybean and whatever else, it took them almost $136 million to create that plant. You know how many genes Monsanto puts into GMO canola? So these genetically modified plants are not necessarily modified by using like man-made things right sometimes in the gmo plant there are good things like there is a bacteria it's called bt and i'm i'm, I'm gonna jack this up right now but i'm gonna try to say it bacillus bacillus it's bacillus i think bacillus thuringiensis who that's not how you say it <laughs> bacillus thuringiensis genus Bacillus thuringiensis. I don't know. It, it's BT for short. So, um, yeah, we'll just, you know, Bravo Tango. It's BT for short. So we'll just call it, we'll, I'm just going to call it Bravo Tango because, um, yeah, I don't think I said that right. But anyway, so again, $136 million to create this genetically modified plant. They're taking things like this, you know, Bravo Tango stuff, this BT stuff, and they're, you know, adding it to the corn DNA, for example. And BT is a natural bacteria that it's used as a pesticide in organic farming, which we'll talk about also, but they're not just like taking, you know, putting things together. It's not like a Frankenstein corn. There is a purpose behind it. But with that being said and giving as much credit as I possibly can to the genetic engineers, companies like Bayer and Corteva account for 72% of planted corn and 66% of planted soybean across the United States. So out of the 90 acres that we have, my 90 million acres of corn, 65-ish acres straight up owned by Bayer and Cortiva. They're the ones who own the seeds. And if you didn't watch my glyphosate episode, I'm going to go through this really quickly, but you can, you can get the deep dive in that episode. So genetically modified plants are the intellectual property of the company that makes them, right? Which makes sense. If Bayer is spending $136 million to make this corn that doesn't die from all the other pests and, you know, insects and things like that that are trying to kill it. So farmers are going to want that, right? Think about it. If your livelihood depends on the amount of corn you can grow on your farm, aren't you going to want to set yourself up for success? Aren't you going to want to make sure that your output is as efficient and as capable as possible? That's all these farmers are doing, right? They were like, listen, I don't want to have to spend millions of dollars on herbicides and insecticides and fungicides when I can just go straight up and buy this GMO plant that doesn't fucking die. And if it does die, it's for reasons that just couldn't have been avoided. So the companies who create these GMOs, they own the rights to those seeds, so I want to get into a little bit about how that came from, right? It's called plant variety protection. 
is what we're talking about. When I say that the Bayer and Corteva own these seeds, it's because they own the patents for the GMOs. So in 1930, there was something called the Plant Patent Act. Yes. And if you were wondering, like, did it just say 1930? Yes. This has not, this is not new, right? Um, it's become kind of, it's become more popular because of a lot of the lawsuits, which again, I talked about in the glyphosate episode of Canada. A David and Goliath legal battle over the ownership of genetically Monsanto, modified seeds. The corporation behind dozens of lawsuits. An analysis that we did of his crop, he must have known. The Plant Patent Act allowed for licensed plants to be sexually produced as long as they aren't sold. So, for example, if Farmer Joe, we'll call him Farmer Joey, let's say Farmer Joey created a tomato plant that is just sweet, it's large, and for some reason, tomato hornworms are not attracted to it, right? If you don't, if you don't know what a tomato hornworm is, they're like the larva of like this type of moth, and they're a bitch. I grow tomatoes, and these hornworms are such a pain in the ass. I can't imagine. I only have like a handful of tomato plants. I can't imagine having like hundreds of acres and having to deal with a tomato hornworm. But here's Joey, Farmer Joe. He created a tomato plant that hornworms seem to not like. Well, he can sell that plant and I can buy that plant, but I can't sell that plant again, right? I can buy the plant. I can have it cross pollinate with another, you know, some of my other plants. I can save the seeds and regrow them. I just can't sell Joey's tomato plant because Joey owns the rights to the plant itself. And that was going well for a while. But what happened was farmers would often save a portion of the harvest as, you know, for, you know, save a portion of the harvest and take the seeds from those things. So instead of having to go back to Joey and buy more seeds, I'm growing the fucking tomato. I just save the seeds and plant them again, right? For the next season. Well, sometimes farmers and sometimes even seed companies would do something called bin run. They're called bin run seeds, which means that they take not tomatoes in this case, but grain from their own crops. They would harvest it, clean it for impurities, maybe treat it, and then sell it to their farmer friends or just, you know, resell it. So there was no incentive for any company to try and create a better seed, a better plant, because they were just, the farmers were just going to grow, you know, plant the seed, grow the plant, save the seed, and then, you know, never need to buy from the seed company or from the company again or from the, you know, big corporation again. So corporations like, well, if I'm going to sell them the seeds once, you know, once every four years, because, you know, every now and then the farmers would come back and buy another batch of seeds just to make sure that, you know, just to reestablish purity and quality. So they're like, what the fuck? Am, why, why would I spend $136 million to create this awesome plant when Farmer Joey is only going to buy from me once every like three, four years or once every three, four season? It's just not worth it. They would, there would be no return on their investment if we're gonna really get into the business of it. It was a very low ROI, it was not worth it for them. That was until the 1970s. So pretty much from 1930 to 1970, the plant world was kind of what it is. Someone creates a plant, cool, right? But they had no control over the plant that they created. That was until the 1970s when the Plant Variety Protection Act came out. This basically gave corporations control and the rights over every single piece of that plant. So if I wanted to buy one of their seeds and I, if I plant the plant, I cannot save the seeds from the plant that I grew. Why? Because for one, the seed that I planted belongs, the, the rights to that seed belongs to the company. And this Plant Variety Protection Act now also gives them the rights to all of the seeds produced for generations to come. And here's the best part. You don't just go to the store and buy these seeds. You go to Bayer, you go to Corteva, and you sign a contract. And the contract tells you what you can and cannot do. And for Bayer, and I don't know about Corteva, but I would imagine it's the same. I know for sure for Bayer that in that contract, they tell you you cannot save the seeds. So if you want to grow that plant next year, you have to come back and buy from us. And up until then, farmers were just saving the seeds and you know, producing them again the following year, which was saving them a ton of money. But now Bayer's like, nah, we own those seeds. If we catch you, if we catch you saving seeds and replanting them, or if we catch you saving seeds and selling them, we're taking your ass to court. You needed cash to buy more land. 
And reselling GMO seeds was your only option. And there will be no mercy. <laughs> there was a movie about this that came out, I think it was like 2007, 2007, 2009, something like that, where Monsanto, which was just recently bought out by Bayer, sued this guy in Canada um, because he was doing that. And it was like... Monsanto will continue with its case tomorrow, focusing on the investigation that led to the discovery of the genetically modified canola. It really ripped off the freaking facade that we had as it came to the agricultural industry. And again, that was in Canada. This is not something that's specific to the United States. These companies operate internationally. We have now the background on GMOs. So we know about the Plant Patent Act of the 1930s. We know about the Plant Variety Protection Act from the 1970s. We know that Bayer and Corteva account for 72% of planted corn and 66% of planted soybean across the United States. So the plants in our country, a majority of our plants, the seeds that were used to grow those things are the intellectual property of Bayer and Corteva. And we know that Bayer and Corteva spend about $136 million to develop one of these GMO plants. That brings me to my next point. And here is the second name drop, Biden. So Biden has this executive order called Promoting Competition in America's Economy. And from that, what he basically said in this executive order is that we need to unfuck things and we need to create some more competition. So the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, created something called the Farmer Seed Liaison. I'm going to be straight up with you. I know, I know this... This executive order might sound really awesome in theory, but the execution of it was so poor. There was no oversight. So that is my problem. I'm just going to say that going into this. If I'm wrong or if you think differently, feel free to correct me. But there really was no fucking oversight for this. So the USDA asked the public, right, what they think we should do. Again, I talked about this in the first episode. Who the fuck knew that the USDA was asking that? They didn't put that shit on social media. They didn't put it in the news. So you know what happened? Only 40 people commented. 40 people in the entire United States, or out of all of the people in the United States, commented. And the rest of the comments were corporations. Corporations who be would benefit from or who can influence this decision by the USDA. And the USDA just said, hey, listen, how can we help the public, right? And some of the corporations that responded basically said, like, we don't know who owns what patents. So genetic engineers who are trying to create maybe an even better corn seed, they don't know what patents Bayer and Corteva have. So, so when they try to go to work on these things, they're like, am I allowed to work on this? How do I find if another company owns this patent? How do I find if it's already been done? So that was one of the biggest complaints from corporations is that they there isn't enough transparency on who owns what patents. And I'll be honest, I've searched the Trademark Patent Office website before. It is horrible. It is like an Excel spreadsheet that you can't filter that has millions and millions of rows and columns. And you're just out here control F in it, just trying to find keywords. That's the U.S. Trademark and Patent Office is just the, the website, at least. And I don't know if there's a different database that these companies use to search. I know that when I search using open source, it's fucking horrible. And that's why attorneys, intellectual properties attorneys, will charge you thousands of dollars to do a trademark and patent search because it takes them for fucking ever, right? If you want to file it, like I know when I filed my trade secret and a couple of my trademarks, it, I had I paid thousands of dollars to have someone who knows the system better than me just search it, right? Because I didn't want to, you know, miss something, then try to file this patent and they reject it and say it already exists, but you don't get your money back. So I digress. Now in the article, and I'm going to leave all these links again, everything's going to be in the episode resources and the link to that is in the description. So the problem I had with kind of what the USDA came out with was it just seemed a bit sketch. Again, because there's no oversight in how this was executed. The Biden administration, their executive order was like, hey, let's promote competition. And to me, it seemed like a PR thing. It was like, let's promote competition. And then they did absolutely fucking nothing. There was no follow through. They didn't go to the USDA and say, hey, okay, what are you doing to promote competition? They just said, you need to promote competition. And then like, that was it. 
and then the agencies take it amongst themselves to figure out like and define it for themselves which if picture this right now i know as navy <laughs> and i went in marine corps reserve but i think about telling seaman timmy right junior sailor and i'm like hey go over there and fix that engine and i just hand him like a wrench and i'm like or go over there and fix that weapon system he's like the fucking what like <laughs> How do I fix it, right? Or if you tell somebody, hey, go fly that plane. It's like, fucking how, right? Like, unless you're talking to a pilot, but like, fucking how, how do I do that, right? And that's what I feel like what happened with this executive order. It's like, promote competition. And then they turn around and say, hey, American public. We are promoting an increase in competition to reduce your costs. And it's like, okay, yeah, but how did you do it? How are they doing it? How is anybody doing it? So to me, it seemed a bit sketch. And I will say that it definitely seemed to keep the seed company's best interest in mind. So it seemed like Bayer and Cortiva were the target audience for this promoting competition. And I say that because they, for one, they use keywords like underprivileged and indigenous communities, like they were going to do us a favor and let us become genetic engineers and test shit out. Like, I don't even know why they brought that up, but like, I don't foresee anybody in the South Bronx having a home lab for other reasons than what you might think. I can't see somebody in the South Bronx having a home lab to slice and dice DNA to create a cool ass corn plant. Like, I don't, I don't understand what the purpose of, of saying that unless they were like, we need to have these keywords in our, in our response. Anyway, and mind you, most of the comments that were solicited from the USDA came from these big corporations and came from the scientists that work for these big corporations. There's only 40 regular ass people who commented, so not really a good representation. And honestly, the 40 people who commented are probably super, con like super, when I say conservative, I mean conservative in, in as it relates to environmental, like the environmental aspect of it. So there are, you know, 40 people that are probably like, GMOs tie yourself to a tree type people and there's nothing wrong with that if that's what if that's your vibe that's your vibe but what I'm saying is those 40 people were not a good representation of the thought process and the mindset of the entire American public but that's our fault we did ourselves a disjustice by or an injustice by not commenting even though we didn't know but whatever that let's let's move on so now I want to talk about the big six okay this is where I'm gonna, so I already talked about corn, I already talked about Biden, I still owe you guys China. I know I mentioned China as one of the countries that we export corn to and that produce corn, but I still owe you the China thing and it is coming up. So in 2015, six firms dominated global markets for seeds and agricultural chemicals. Now I'm reading this straight out the USDA's mouth. So those big six are BS. BASF, or BASF, I'm going to call it, Bravo Alpha Sierra Foxtrot, BASF, Bayer, Dow Chemical, DuPont, Monsanto, and Syngenta. And obviously Monsanto is the company that's being sued right now. So the big six, right? These six firms didn't just make seeds. They produced everything. So they produced and sold pesticides. This is going to be herbicides, insecticides, fungicides seed treatments, which are seed coatings to protect, protect against insects or fungus, crop seeds, and seed traits. And I'm going to break that down real quick so you understand what these big companies are doing. So the pesticides, we know what that is, right? We know what the herbicides are. It's weed killers. Insecticides kill insects. Fungicides kill fungus. Seed treatments. Now, these are the things that you put. So when you go, when Farmer Joe goes and buys a bag of seeds from Bayer, and he, if he, he's not going to plant them right away. So when you're storing these seeds, they have to be protected from insects and from fungus. So you have to, you have no choice but to buy the seed protectants or the seed coating from the company, right? It's how they get you. It's like a package deal. Like if you buy one, you have to buy the other. And if you buy Bayer seed treatments, you can't buy Corteva seeds. Like it has to come from the same company. The next thing is the actual crop seeds itself. And then something called seed traits. Now, seed traits are going to be their patents. They're going to license their patents. So let's say they created a really cool seed trait that is that includes this BT, that Bravo Tango bacteria I was talking about earlier. Well, if they patent the way that, that that's done, they can say, hey, hey, other company over there, 
you want to you wanna get this bacteria, this cool ass insecticide into your plant, we'll sell you the seed trait, right? So they also have these other things, right? And if they become up with a cool way to slice and dice DNA, they can patent that too. So if somebody wants to use their cool slice and dice method, they have to license it from them for a pretty fucking penny. So they're finding ways to make money every way you turn. So as of 2015, there were six companies. They were referred to as the big six. Well, the big six became the big four very quickly. Chem China, which is a state owned Chinese company, Here's that last word I mentioned. They acquired Syngenta, Dow Chemical, and Dewpoint, and they merged and became Corteva. So the two companies that own a majority, they account for 72% of planted corn and 66% of planted soybean. One of them is owned by China. And then Bayer acquired Monsanto. So big six became big four. Again, Bayer bought Monsanto. So we have China who put all put three companies together, merged three of them to become Corteva. Then Bayer bought Monsanto. So there we have our the two highest producing companies. The other two are they're smaller, but they're still in the, the big game, right? But Bayer and Mon and Corteva own a majority of our shit. So that means that every time Farmer Joe plants a seed, he's either planting a seed for Bayer, for the US, or for Kitiva, for China. And I wanna bring this full circle for you. I gave out a lot of numbers, a lot of definitions, a lot of percentages, and if you're out there like, the fucking what is the point of you saying all of this? Oh, look who wants to get to the point all of a sudden. The reason why I'm saying this is because in February of 2023, the USDA came out with something called the Global Demand for Fuel Ethanol Through 2030. And basically in this 114 page report, the USDA basically says that the use of gasoline and the requirements that we have for oil have been gradually decreasing even before COVID. Obviously with COVID, there was a huge dip. And even though it did go back up slightly, it's still continuing on a trajectory downward. But what we are seeing is an increase in the use of biofuels, specifically ethanol. So what they are saying is that even though we're seeing a decrease in gasoline, we're seeing an increase in ethanol. And I'm gonna read you exactly what it says. The US Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration, yeah, that's right, they say e energy twice, or the EIA, projections to 2030 indicate that US motor gasoline consumption is expected to see changes ranging from 4.5 billion gallon decrease, which is 3%, to a 7.2 billion gallon increase, 5.3, from 2021. Again, adjusting for COVID. These figures correspond to average consumption changes between 499 million and 797 millions of gallons per year. EIA projections also indicate U.S. consumption of ethanol in motor gasoline and E85, which is that flex fuel, is expected to increase between 196 or 196 million gallons, which is 1.4%, and 1.4 billion gallons above 2021 levels, depending on the U.S. economic growth over the decade. The projected increase in ethanol consumption across all scenarios, despite falling gasoline consumption in some scenarios, is due in part to EIA's assumption that renewable fuel standard will increase total U.S. consumption of renewable fuels. So there were a lot of laws that were passed to get us to use renewable fuels. And for some fucking reason, we were like, oh, ethanol, right? Ethanol is a good renewable fuel because all, all the American public sees is corn being turned into shit they put in their fucking tank. They don't understand the process going from point A to point B, and it's not their fault because nobody fucking tells them. I'm just... I'm a little angry at that because it, I, I feel like every time I learn more, I feel like I've been played, right? I got played and that's that. And that's not a good feeling, but it's, it's misinformation. We were either not informed or we were misinformed. And we're thinking, oh, we grow some fucking corn, throw that shit in our fucking oil, in our gasoline. And it, you know, it's less drilling of oil that we have to do, right? Because we know oil bad. That's essentially what the fuck I think happened here. So again, a link to this report is going to be in the episode resources. So basically what they're saying is, okay, 
the use of gasoline went down. It came up a little bit, but overall, we're probably going to see gasoline consumption continue to go down and the use of renewable fuel go up because of this renewable fuel standard. Now, in this report, they give a couple different scenarios. In each scenario, ethanol is going to be used more. So, okay, so ethanol is going to be used more, which means we have to either plant more corn or attribute more of the corn we're already growing to producing ethanol. We're already seeing corn being grown in places that it doesn't naturally grow, right? If we're seeing corn being grown in Michigan year-round, like, how, <laughs> right? That's a cold-ass environment. The growing season is very short, and, you know, places in the Midwest where corn is primarily being grown, like, that's where we expect to see it. But now corn is popping up everywhere because it is extremely profitable and because there's a demand for it. If corn keeps going up and we only got 90 million acres, like, we're going to have to start putting cornfields somewhere. Now, my problem is that if we need to produce more corn, that means we need that means we need to buy more corn seeds, which means we have to buy more shit from Bayer and Corteva, which means we have to buy more shit from China. So the concept of this you know, of Biden's promoting competition in America was essentially hoping that with more transparency, there would be more competition. And that is because between 1990 and 2020, prices paid by farmers for crop seeds increased an average of 170%. So if Farmer Joe was buying seeds for a dollar, he's now buying seeds for like $3. And that's why our food costs so fucking much is because it trickles down. So, for example, seed prices for crops grown predominantly with GMOs rose 463%. So if John went to Bayer to buy a seed that used to cost him a dollar and now cost him $5. And this compares with a 56% increase in commodity output prices, meaning it just quadruple the increase that we're seeing everywhere else. And this could be for a lot of different reasons. So, and I'm going to walk you through a scenario just to show you how it trickles down. So we're going to go the dry mill route because that's the most common. So I'm going to break this, these numbers down for you real quick. We're not going to include logistic cost, overhead, anything like that. We're just going to say every single person in this machine makes a 30% margin. So if Joey used to buy the seeds for a dollar, he's going to sell it to the dry mill for a dollar thirty. The dry mill is going to do their thing and they're going to sell it to like Kellogg's, for example. And I'm probably like missing some people, but let's say they sell it to Kellogg's for $1.70, right? They tack on their 30%. Well, Kellogg's is then going to sell it to the supermarket for $2.20. The supermarket is going to sell it to you for $2.99, okay? Now, this is where I'm not including logistics. Like if Joey buys seeds for a dollar. You're not buying a box of cereal for $2.99, right? You're buying a box of cereal for like, you know, $6.99 or something like that, right? Because there's some cost that I'm not adding. I'm just trying to keep like the baseline simple. So now that there is a 463% increase, let's say Joey is now having to buy the seeds he used to buy for a dollar. He's now buying them for $5. That means he sells it to the dry mill for $6.50. And that means the dry mill sells it to Kellogg's to make their Frosted Flakes for $8.45, Kellogg's makes their Frosted Flakes and they sell the Frosted Flakes to the grocery store for $10.99. The grocery store sells it to you for $14.28. So you used to buy it for $2.99, now you're buying it for $14. Do you see how the inc how the price increases? Now again, this is like not the best example because I'm not putting all of the other things that go into it, but you can see that charging Joey an extra $4 becomes exponentially more expensive for you, the consumer who's buying the end product. You see, when my costs go up, I have to pass that along to the consumer. That is the whole point of this example, is that it went from $3 to $14 very f***ing quickly, and you had no control over that. It was just everybody tacking on their 30% margin. And I only include the dry mill Kellogg's in the grocery store. There's a lot more people that are involved. So that's what I mean when I say I feel like I was bamboozled when it came to this stuff. Congratulations, Ross, because Chandler, you've been bamboozled. I hope that you guys now understand how Biden, corn, 
and China are linked, right? Biden has his executive order. China owns one of the largest seed companies in the fucking world, especially in the United States. They are responsible for a majority of the plants that we're planting, including our largest export. And then we have corn, which is our largest export. The one other thing I mentioned earlier is I defined organic. So I'm gonna go through that really quickly because I have a little special treat for you guys at the end of this. There's something called the non-GMO project. All they wanna do is preserve the integrity of diverse genetic inheritance that they say is essential for environmental health and, and ecological harmony. And what that basically means is like, hey, listen, they don't have a problem with GMOs. Their problem is like, we have 90 million acres of straight up just corn. There's no genetic diversity there. There's no diversity in our planting. We have something called monocrops, which time and time again, scientists have said like these monocrops are terrible for the environment, but we need to produce corn because that's our largest export. And now we need to produce even more corn because we need it for ethanol. We're not producing corn so we can fucking eat it, right? 60% of it goes to FSI, food, seeds, and, and industrial, but food is a very small portion of that. So if 60% is going towards this stuff, maybe only 20% is going to food. So we have 90 million acres and only 18 of those acres is going to food. Like, come on guys, that's fucked up. Well, that's fucked up in all kinds of ways now, isn't it? It's one of the ways the country makes money. So it's like, a risk that they were willing to take because they need to bring money into the country. I mean, based on the deficit and the way they're just printing money is, you know, they need more of that shit. So I, that's just one thing that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned. Let's get into organic now. There are over 40 private organizations and state agencies that certify things as organic. Well, everybody at one point, everybody had their own definition for what organic means. So the government finally came out with the Org Organic Foods Production Act or OFPA, which defines the term organic. So now when someone, when you see that organic label, it is now regulated. So it's not just whatever somebody wants to define as organic, it has a legit purpose. The National Organic Program, which is by the USDA, has a list of allowable and prohibited substances for organic food. This is another CFR, which I'll include and I'll just tell you what it is. It's CFR Title Seven, Subtitle B, Chapter I, Subchapter M, Part 205, Subpart G. The link is in the motherfucking episode resources, so don't even worry about that. But basically, if you go through that list, it's not hard to read. It tells you exactly what's allowed and exactly what's not allowed to be used on organic foods. Again, organic foods are not allowed to use synthetic pesticides, meaning they're using those that things like Bravo Tango, right? That BT stuff, that bacteria that's natural, naturally occurring. The great thing is, and you'll hear this time and time again, is people will say, well, you know, or, organic foods use more pesticides. And it's like they use uh, different types of pesticides. So maybe, you know, non-organic foods and GMOs only need to use glyphosate. Whereas organic foods needs to use this bacteria and vinegar and all of this other stuff. But what they don't tell you is they use it in such small quantities. And I, this is a bone I have to pick with a lot of people who are like, well, organic food uses more pesticides. It's like, they don't. They don't use more pesticides. They have a different variety of pesticides because BT might be good for this, vinegar might be good for this, orange zest might be good for that. So they have to use a bunch of different ones. And it's at a way smaller proportion, right? We're not talking 90 million acres of organic fields. We're talking maybe a million acres. So one, it's used proportionally less, right? Or per capita, it's gonna be less. Secondly, it's natural stuff. And yes, natural stuff can still be toxic, which is why it's so potent. So that instead of having to use 750, you know, thousand gallons of it, that's how much glyphosate they're gonna be using. Maybe they only have to use a hundred gallons of it because it's so potent, they only need to sprinkle a little bit. So there's also that. There's also the dosage amounts that nobody fucking talks about. Everybody's like, well, glyphosate is, you know, it's actually really safe because you have to be exposed to a lot of it one period of time for it to be toxic. And it's like, okay, like, well, you only, you know, vinegar, if you're exposed to a lot of vinegar, it could kill you. It's like, if you're exposed to a lot of water, it can kill you. So miss me with that bullshit. Tell me how much you have to use on the same amount of land. If we have 1 million acres, how much organic stuff do we have to use and how much non-organic stuff do we have to use? And if I'm standing in either of those fields, 
which one will cause me more damage? And the answer is exactly what you're going to think. It's the non-organic. You're, there's going to be more damage to you with, with exposure to the, synthet- to the synthetic stuff than the organic stuff. Hands down. And if you want to see that, again, it's in the CFR. It's in the episode resources. I'm not talking out of my ass. The government tells us straight up what it is. So, so are GMO safe? Initially, my stance was that they are safe. My stance now is that it's really, it's unknown. There's a lack of credible long-term studies. Almost all of the studies done were done in rats. And that's cool. There was a study done showing that, cat, that you know, rats don't get cancer from eating all GMOs. There's a study that shows that GMOs do not alter the DNA of rats. And it's like, okay, there's a lot of positive studies that have come out that talk about rats or that are on rats. It's just not ethical, really, to do a study like that on humans. There's no way to track the consumption of GMOs in humans. And I'll be completely honest with you. Most of the GMO products, they're, they're not in your produce section. If you go to buy an apple or a zucchini or some shit like that from the produce section, most of those produce, if, if all of them, they're not GMOs. But you're, where you're going to find the GMOs is in the processed foods. You're going to find GMOs in, in your cereal, right? In, in those aisles because they take those GMO crops and they turn them into something else, right? They process them. And I will say that if something was bioengineered, there is a label that goes on the product saying that it is bioengineered. But there is a, I don't want to say statute of limitation, but if you take corn and you dry mill it into cornflakes and then Kellogg's takes it and then Kellogg's turns it into whatever to eventually become frosted flakes, your frosted flakes is not going to say that it's genetically engineered. It's not, it's, or biologically engineered. It's not going to say that because the flakes themselves, one, do not occur naturally in, in nature, right? They don't occur, you don't, you're not just see fucking frosted flakes trees. So at what level do we have to start labeling things GMO? That's a question, but so we can't say if GMOs are safe or not. There's not enough credible evidence. So that's my stance. Do I think they're safe? No. Do I think they're not safe? No. I'm kind of in the middle. If someone told me, hey, by the way, the salad you just ate was all GMO, like, I wouldn't cry myself to sleep that night. It's like, well, okay, yeah, cool. Everything you're eating is genetically modified. Like, I, that's just how it is. Now, there has been an increase in glyphosate, which has, has a ton of serious effects to include a decline in native plant species. And oh, yeah, it's believed to cause cancer. So we're seeing an increase in the use of these synthetic pesticides and these synthetic pesticides are brought to you by Bayer and Corteva and the big four so right because GMOs when they slice and dice that DNA you know what they do they make those GMOs resistant to these herbicides so what does that mean if you take an organic plant and you spray Roundup on it it's going to kill that plant usually depending on what type of plant, but it's more than likely it's going to kill that plant. So farmers can't use Roundup and synthetic products on organic stuff because it's going to kill their shit. But let's say you slice and dice some DNA. Now you have a plant that is resistant to Roundup. So what does that mean? That means that farmers can then dump as much Roundup as they want on their field. They don't have to worry about killing their plants. They The Roundup will kill exactly what it's meant to kill, which in this case, Roundup kills weeds. So anything that might suffocate the plants, right? They can just fucking kill that shit. We also do have some GMO plants that inc- have incorporated protectants, which make them resistant to certain insects and things like that. And that's going to be that Bravo Tango I talked about, that bacteria. I want to demystify something real quick. The FDA straight up says farmers may use more weed killer, but it's cool because the FDA regulates things like weed killers. Now I'm like, well... Isn't the big argument from scientists that, you know, they use less pesticides for GMO plants? But now I'm just like, the FDA straight up saying y'all at least use more weed killer. So I'm like, make that make sense because it doesn't make sense to me. I thought you guys used less. Well, that doesn't make sense. Overall, in terms of GMO being safe, we don't know. Now, I will say this. There is now something called a GMO salmon, so genetically modified salmon, and genetically modified pork. I don't eat pork, but I'm just saying, seems kind of weird. Now, I know the salmon is supposed to grow at a faster rate than regular salmon, and I'm assuming 
that's like one of the things, one of their pain points is that it takes so long for a salmon to grow to be full grown. And I know in like salmon farms, they will grab a bunch of salmon and then throw back any of the smaller ones. So I'm assuming that's what that's for, but it's still kind of weird to me because I'm just like, okay, you're trying to get it to grow faster. How'd you get it to grow faster? And second, like what else did you put in here, right? Is the salmon less susceptible to certain diseases? Um, Because if you've ever seen a salmon farm, it's fucking gross. It's so gross. Like I saw it and I couldn't eat salmon for a long ass time and I love salmon and that shit was just like, "Mm." but then you're like, do I get wild caught salmon when there's all this fucking shit about netting? being all fucked up so it's like oh i don't know what to do then i just go fishing myself i guess but i digress anyway so that's kind of like the overall thing when it comes to the overall concept of whether gmos are safe or not it's like the gmo plant itself we don't know if it's safe for the most part most scientists are saying that it is safe based on rat studies so we can't really say anything about that but then you have people that are saying that it's not safe because of the amount of pesticides and synthetic weed killers and insect killers and things like that that people that farmers are using that now Monsanto's being sued over so it's like "Mm, I don't know it's kind of inconclusive if you will now I want to do something that I didn't think I was ever going to do and I'm going to debunk this post from Dr. Andrea Love in my very first episode I said that she was an immunologist that I respect I take that back I've lost all respect for her now I'm not accusing her of anything but what I am saying is throw this post the f*** away. Just throw the whole thing away. And you'll see that I commented on it and the kind of like disagreement that her and I had was so stupid. So stupid. And I, not that I feel like I was right, because I do, but I just don't understand why it was a disagreement to begin with. I talked to a lot of other scientists and I've never had a disagreement like this, ever. There have been situations where scientists will educate me on things that I might not be aware of, which have has altered my opinion. But then there have been times where the scientist is like, you know what? That's a really good point. Let's talk about that further. That's what I love. I love to get that. I love to get these conversations with professionals in their field. And I'm like, hey, listen, I'm not a PhD in environmental science. So this is my opinion. What do you think? Kind of thing. And, And that's kind of always where I've been at. But in her post, she says that GMO has become the common term consumers and popular media use to describe foods that have been created through genetic engineering. This term is not generally used to refer to plants or animals developed with selective breeding. That's not what she said in her fucking post when she was like, Well, these dogs that are bred are examples of of genetic modification and genetic engineering. They're just like GMOs. I'm like, the f***? No, they're not, (laughs) right? So that was the first thing that I had against her post. Just in her description, and I think... She might have changed that because I did bring it up and I was like, that's not the same thing. I defined GMOs and even the government straight up says it's a common term consumers and popular media use to describe foods that have been created through genetic engineering. This term is not generally used to refer to plants or animals developed with selective breeding. So your f***ing shapoodle, your shadoodle or whatever the f*** is out there. That's not genetically engineered unless some lab rat sliced and diced that shit. Some lab, you know, engineer did something with the, the poodle's DNA. And same thing like Pepper Joe. Pepper Joe Crosby breeds peppers all motherfucking day. That's what he does for a living. I bought some of his fucking seeds. He crossbreeds these plants to make the hottest fucking pepper seed you've ever seen. Pepper Joe is not in a laboratory trying to make the hottest pepper at a DNA level, right? So just... Throw that part of the f***ing post away. Now, she has like this unbiased scientific newsletter. I actually got another one of her newsletters last night. It's like, glyphosate is safe. And I just like completely tore that shit apart. But this newsletter specifically about GMOs contained links that led to a f***ing blog post. You are a scientist. And all of the references and hyperlinks in your newsletter, your scientific newsletter went to a blog post and the blog post is run by a farmer slash lawyer out in bum nowhere. So it's like, that's, she's going to be very biased. She's a farmer. Like, why wouldn't you link actual scientific research? And then the scientific research she tends to reference is her own. So you might think, wow, I'm reading this, everything's 
in hyperlink. It's like she's using all these great resources. But they either go to a blog, her blog, or her substack, or some random article that she is an author on. She doesn't use outside sources. The one time she used an outside, so an outside source, I completely tore that shit apart. And I'm going to read you guys what my statement was. So how can you call yourself unbiased? That's a question. I'm not accusing her of anything. I'm just asking, how do you call yourself unbiased? You don't use any other fucking resources. And then here, here's the best part. She was a keynote speaker or a guest for Crop Life. And if you don't know who Crop Life is, they're the people who manufacture the pesticides that we're talking about. So when Bayer creates Roundup, they send that shit to Crop Life to produce, right? Crop Life is a manufacturer of pesticides. So if those are your homies, isn't it in your best interest to say that pesticides are safe? And if that's the case, how come on any of your research articles, you're not claiming that? You're not claiming your association with this very company. I mean, isn't that your due diligence as a scientist? Am I wrong about that? I don't know. Now, she has kind of received a ton of backlash for her unbiased science podcast, which she kind of backed away from. So she took herself off of the podcast and all the other things that she was originally associated with. She has her immunologic business, which I looked up. I'm not going to share the information because she has it registered to her home address, but just know that it's, it took me a minute, right? Because she says, she says that she is the executive director for the American Lyme Disease Foundation. I did some research on the American Lyme Disease Foundation and they were bringing in a ton of money. But up until like last year, they were only bringing in like $10,000, which means that, and she put on, and they, like they put on the 990, their IRS filing, because they're, they're a nonprofit, that she dedicates like five hours a week or something like that. So I'm like, okay, they're only bringing, they're only claiming to bring in $10,000 a year. That's definitely not enough to pay you a PhD and all of the other medical doctors that are on the board. So where is Andrea Love getting paid? She is still owner of the Unbiased Podcast, but the Unbiased Podcast is a part of a larger corporation. And here's where I connected some dots. So the Unbiased Science Podcast is owned by a company called Vital Statistics Consulting. Now, the source that I got this from is called SourceWatch, so it's kind of like a Wikipedia, so I'm going to take that with a grain of salt because I don't know who's maintaining this information. It's not like it's not like Wikipedia in that I can go in and I can update information. Um, SourceWatch is a nonprofit, but her and Jessica Steyer are a part of this unbiased science project, which has come under a ton of backlash because they're like, how are you unbiased when... You are funded by Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson. So you're promoting the COVID vaccine. Well, no shit. You're funded by them. You're funded by, by fucking Procter and Gamble. You're funded by 3M. You're funded by, you know, Crop Life. You're going to go speak at Crop Life. How can you be unbiased when you're taking funding from the companies whose products you are talking about, who you are discussing? So how can I trust you when you're being paid off? Raise your hand if that sounds fishy. It just doesn't make sense. That's like going to an organic store and finding out that they're funded by non-organic companies. It's like, how are you not biased, right? How are you saying you're organic or how are you saying you're unbiased when you're receiving funds from these people and then claiming on all of the research that you produce that you're not, you have no conflict of interest. Now, I'm not accusing her of anything because... According to all of the records I was able to find, she took herself off of these businesses. And now Jessica Steyer is like running her podcast. Although Dr. Andrea Love was with Jessica at this Crop Life event and was a speaker there. So there's that. I did some more digging. When you do some digging into vital statistics into these other companies, the name William Gallo is going to pop up. And the name Jessica Steyer and the name Andrea Love, you know, these are going to pop up. And guess what? Vital Statistics is a government contractor. They own contracts with the Department of Veterans Affairs. So more likely than not, Andrea Love is a government contractor. That's a bit of speculation. It's not like I was able to find that information anywhere. All I'm saying is that the company that she is a consultant for holds government contracts. 
I'm just throwing that out there. And then she has her immunologic stuff going on, her sub stack and all this other stuff. I saw, I, I first saw her, the first time I ever followed her was because she was um, on Wired. Wired does these like help desk things where they bring in professionals in a field and they answer popular questions on Twitter that are related to their field. That's when I found her. I followed her. I liked a lot of her stuff. And then all of a sudden her shit just got fucking wrong, like just fucking weird to me. And I'm like, how do you call yourself a scientist? That's kind of my beef with that is the misinformation being produced by someone who's who very clearly has some questionable backing. I'll just leave it at that. I'm not trying to get hit with some defam defamation bullshit. Now, if you go to their website, again, I'm leaving all these links in the description. If you go to their website, Andrea Love is not listed on their website as a consultant, but they do include immunologist, right? Everything else I was, I was able to find points that she at some point in time consulted for them. And they obviously own the Unbiased Science prod, uh, podcast and they have government contracts, which as a veteran who goes to the VA, I'm like, well, no, f now I know why the VA sucks. Look at the ta look at the talent you're bringing in. But anyway, that's my beef right there was not just because the, I, the, I felt that the stuff that she was posting very much illuminated the possibility of some conflict of interest and some actual bias but also because of her response. What I found in her response is that she deferred. The comments that she was making just straight up deferred, right? Any challenge to her, her thought process or to her post, it's you're a fucking lie. Literally, she's like, that's factually inaccurate or some shit like that. I'm like, no, it's not. Um, Cause I basically told her like, hey, listen, I have no issue. I have no beef with GMOs. My problem is the companies that make money off of off of this and that are able to control the price of our food. And she was like, that's not true. And I'm like, listen, homie, you can talk to me all day and school me in immunology, but when it comes to business, when it comes to following the money trail, home girl, take a step back. That's my bread and butter. And then when we get into, when we tap into the like, okay, well, you want to have a conversation now? I'm going to tear your argument to, to pieces. And honestly, I can tear any argument to pieces. You can tell me the sky is blue and I can tear that shit apart. So it's probably unfair to say that. But I was expecting more of a conversation as two professionals in different fields to come together and talk about a similar topic. Instead, she told me I was wrong. I posted resources. That didn't fucking matter. Um, sorry, I didn't include your farm girl USA fucking or farmer's daughter usa is the name of the blog post that she was like her flagship source in her newsletter about gmos and about glyphosate so i'm like sorry i didn't use your post i'm using you know i'm using legit usda references and the usda is straight up saying that bayer and cortiva own 75 or 72 percent of our fucking crops like i'm straight up telling you this because it's a fucking fact by your homies at the usda and she was like, no, nah, that's incorrect. And then she pivots and she's like, well, are we not going to talk about the non-GMO project and all the money being sunk there? So my response to her was, yeah, okay. If you want to talk about that, we can talk about that. I was just trying to stay on topic. And the topic was about GMOs. But if you want to pivot because you're trying to defer because you ain't got shit to say about the topic at hand, we can talk about that too, baby girl. Like, come on now. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. But... I'm going to approach it from my swim lane. My swim lane is business. My swim lane is security. So unless it's a threat to national security, or if you want to talk about the money trail, then I got you, boo, right? I got you. Let's talk about it. So that's kind of where that conversation led. <laughs> and I'm going to read to you my response. And if you want to jump on the petty train with me, and if you want to read the conversation, I'll leave a link to it. Now, she does use one legit scientific source from the genetic literacy project this article that she posted all for some fucking reason the link was broken but when i found the article this the reference she used completely debunks her entire fucking post the one that she used which if you clicked on it the link was broken coincidentally but i'm gonna read to you what my, what my response was i said and i quote since you tagged me in your story pause so after this like little debate we got into, I commented on her post again because she kept on telling me to go to her newsletter. And I'm like, I fucking read your newsletter. I'm talking about your newsletter in this post. I'm talking about how you use the fucked up resources. So I made another comment, um, a new comment. And I was like, it's crazy that when someone argues with you, you make them go to your newsletter, which by the way, if you want to read the full newsletter, you have to pay for it. 
So she tags me in her post and calls me rude and says that it's rude of me to ask her to state something that she's already written in her newsletter. So that's the backstory. I also commented again, this long ass post, and this is the post that I said. So I said, cause you know, you can't respond to a story. It, it will just go to her. So, okay, let me, let me get back to this. Let me get back to this. So again, this is what I said. Since you tagged me in your story, I wanted to comment here to avoid any confusion. First, I read your newsletter. You cited sources like the Farmer's Daughter USA, a blog run by a woman named Amanda from Southwest Michigan. While she is an attorney, she does not represent the entire agricultural community, nor the full scope of facts. You also refer to the GMO project, which is owned by CropLife International, a Belgium-based company that promotes agricultural technologies such as pesticides and plant biotechnology. Cough, cough, the company that she went to go be a guest speaker on. I won't argue that GMOs are safe, as I agree with you on this point, which I just said that I take that back, but I digress. There's ample scientific evidence supporting their safety, and frankly, I would need to do extensive research to argue otherwise. I did the extensive research, and I argue otherwise. To level the playing field and avoid relying solely on my USDA reference, which you didn't seem to favor, I'll use one of your sources, the Genetic Literacy Project. In the article, you tried to tag, though the link was broken, which is odd, they state, the anti-GMO activists regularly claim that Monsanto sues farmers who have accidentally reused seeds or found their farms inadvertently, quote unquote, contaminated by genetically engineered seeds. That's not true. Monsanto does sue farmers who use its seeds without licensing agreements, directly con which directly contradicts Andrea Love's claim that they do not sue farmers. The article also mentions that Monsanto has sued well over 100 additional farmers who have used its seeds without licensing agreements and has settled over 700 cases outside of court. In each of these cases, Monsanto has won the court battle. Next, regarding your section on glyphosate, you claim it's safe, yet Monsanto slash Bayer has paid $11 billion in settlements to 95,000 individuals slash petitioners with 165,000 claims in counting. They haven't lost every case, the ones that proceed meet the Daubert standard, which requires petitioners to essentially prove that this chemical caused or increased their risk of cancer. So you're suggesting that your newsletter is correct and the 165,000 claimants and $11 billion in settlements are wrong? Should we send your newsletter to Monsanto to save them billions of dollars? Sarcasm aside, I've tried to offer an alternative perspective to what you're presenting. Unfortunately, you didn't represent the scientific community well. Instead, you labeled me as rude and attempted to make an example out of anyone who disagrees with you. If scientists insist on operating within an echo chamber, how will we ever progress? This is disappointing, especially in an age where public trust in scientists is already eroding. I'll go ahead and give myself a mic drop because all I was trying to say is, yo, how are you right? If you're so right, all oh, my lights went out. So if you're watching this, it's because this is a long ass episode and my lights are dying. If you are so right, we should send your shit to fucking Monsanto. Let them know. Why are they paying billions of dollars if you got the answers? If you have all the answers and if GMOs are safe and if glyphosate doesn't cause cancer and all this other stuff that you're claiming, then then you should tell them $11 billion. Like, come on, girl, go, go tell Monsanto. Go tell Bayer because you got all the answers. The truth of the matter is, this is just her opinion, and she's not backing it up with any scientific journals. Now, her latest newsletter about glyphosate being safe legit just goes back to her own substack. All of the references go to, like, shit that she's written. There were some actual articles that when she talked about, like, glyphosate and some other things, they went back to, like, scientific articles that define what that is. 
But in general, it's trash. Throw the whole fucking thing away. It's garbage. That is my God honest opinion. I'm just saying the whole fucking thing is trash. And then when I try to have a conversation with you, you're just like, Meh. I don't know. Maybe I'm a little bitter about it. Cause I'm just like, how are, how are people looking up to you? And the answer is they just don't know enough or they are creating echo chambers. And what she is saying aligns to, to their personal beliefs. It's called confirmation bias. Now, I agree with some of the stuff that she says, and there's a lot of stuff that I don't agree with what she says. Overall, I don't think GMOs are the worst thing as it relates to the actual organism itself, the actual plant. The other processes involved, I have some questions on and I have some reservations about, and I think that's fair. Am I, am I biased? Yes, I am. I prefer organic. I grew up in a Whole Foods kind of house. We didn't need a ton of processed stuff, right? Even living in the South Bronx, I wasn't rich. We were not even middle class, but my mom still found a way to make sure that we were as healthy as possible because that is my culture. That is my ethnicity. However, that's become a bias of mine. I think that that's the best way to do things, right? I'm never sick. I mean, yeah, I have some fucking allergies, but like I'm very rarely sick and I have a very robust immune system, as is my sister, as is my mom. My mom is... My mom, I'm not going to spill her age out there. I'm sure she doesn't want me to say that. But if you saw my mom, you would think she's my sister. My mom is extremely healthy. She's extremely fit. And she doesn't eat a bunch of bullshit. She doesn't take supplements. I mean, she has vitamins and shit like that. But like, it's, and the same thing with my whole family. Maybe it's like a Guyanese thing. I don't know. But like, that's just how I grew up. And my Italian side is a little different. But again, it's still like whole foods and natural products and things like that. Like, it's how I grew up, so that is definitely my bias. But with that being said, I hope you were able to take something away from this. As promised, we mentioned Biden, corn, and China. I linked all of those things for you. We talked about organic. We talked about GMO. We talked about pesticides and patents and things like that. And if you want kind of like the basis of where this came from, check out this episode right here. Mm-hmm.